I'll go ahead and record it just in case. Uh, okay. I'm sure some people either missed the broadcast or anything like that and, and would still want to catch uh, catch it. Okay, sure, sure. So anyway, yes, thank, <laughs> thank you so much for having me and, uh, and getting this rolling. So the title of my talk is Why Does Kanban Hate Us? I uh, actually gave this talk at Sirius Scrum last year, except A, I was on time, and B, uh, it wasn't in the main track. So I'm really excited to be able to give it, uh, give it again here in the main track. So I want to talk a little bit about who we are, who I am as a presenter, uh, who you are as the audience. Uh, if you're here in this talk, then you are probably aware that there's some kind of tension, rightly or wrongly, between Scrum camps and Kanban camps, and you're curious as to what all the hubbub is about. Uh, you might be familiar with one, but not necessarily the other, and so you're curious about finding out what the differences might be. Or maybe in your, you're in a position where you're kind of wondering which is better for you, or if it's viable to use these things together. So here's a little bit about me. I'm Phil Ledgerwood. I'm the owner of Integrity Inspired Solutions. There's our website address up there. We're a custom software development company. I am a coder. Okay? I'm a programmer. I write code almost every day. I'm a product manager, a project manager. I'm an agile coach. I'm a certified scrum master and a certified pro Kanban trainer. So I've been infected by both camps uh, and I stir up fights on LinkedIn. And that's my uh, handle there on LinkedIn if you if you want to connect with me there, and I hope you do. I want to say briefly uh, just a quick word about my biases, um, because every speaker about these topics is going to have biases, and I think it's nice when people broadcast them so that you know. Uh, at Integrity, we only use Scrum for a very limited number of engagements. We almost always use Kanban everywhere. Uh, I really love Kanban. And, uh, and so if I say things and you think, well, I don't think Phil's being very fair to Scrum, you might actually be right. Um, so I just want to make that clear up front, just so that you sort of have that frame of reference uh, for me as we go. Obviously, you know, you just like with any presentation you hear, uh, have your critical thinking hat on, you know, and just take people's opinions and views as helpful, but not necessarily where you're going to end up. So for the first part of the presentation, let's talk about what the fuss is about. Why is there even any kind of tension between scrum camps and Kanban camps at all? Well, first of all, let's talk about the common ground that these things share. First of all, both of them come from manufacturing, which is kind of a surprise for Scrum folks uh, a lot of times. Sometimes you'll hear the whole like Kanban comes from manufacturing, but Scrum comes from software development. And that is not accurate. Uh, they actually both come from manufacturing. The uh, Oops Law paper that Sutherland wrote about Scrum is a software adaptation of a manufacturing paper. And so just like Kanban for software is a software adaptation of things like Toyota's implementation of Kanban, uh, the software version of Scrum is a software implementation of the manufacturing version of Scrum. So both come from a manufacturing background. Both of them restrict the amount of work in process, although they do this in very different ways, and we're going to talk about this. Both of them allow you to add your own stuff. Neither strategy says, do these things, but don't do anything else. In fact, they both go out of their way to say, you're going to have to come up with your own stuff to really make this work. Both facilitate incremental delivery. Neither of them talk about engineering. Neither of them mandate any, uh, you know, TDD or um, domain driven design or uh, CICD or anything like that. That is kind of up to your teams to figure out. And both of them incorporate an overlapping progressive application of each part of the software. I meant to say software development lifecycle. I kind of botched that acronym software life development cycle. It should be SDLC. Um, as you develop a feature rather than a phase gate approach to the whole project. So the idea is that analysis, development, testing, these are all overlapping activities that happen over and over and over again throughout product development, rather than being distinct phases that the product moves through. 
It's important to note that both Scrum and Kanban have overall mechanisms that can increase your agility. So it's not a matter of one being agile with air quotes, one not being agile. It's not even a matter of one being more agile than the other. They both have mechanisms that if you use them can increase your agility. One isn't necessarily agile and the other isn't. So let's do a quick overview of what each of these systems require. So here's what Scrum requires, or how I like to say it, this is what Scrum really cares about. Okay, so if you've ever read the Scrum Guide, these should be familiar. We have the values, commitment, focus, openness, respect, and courage. And in order to do Scrum, like you have to have all these things. If, you, if your team decides, hey, we don't wanna value courage, you can't, uh, Scrum makes you. And since you're all a pack of cowards, they can probably force you to do so very easily, you know? So Scrum requires a certain set of values. It requires these accountabilities, developers, product owners, Scrum master, requires these events, sprint, sprint planning, daily Scrum, sprint review, sprint re retrospective, and it requires these artifacts to come out of all this, the product backlog, the sprint backlog, and the increment. So these are the things that are mandatory parts of Scrum. Now, of course, as teams, we can always decide, hey, we don't wanna do this, that, or the other thing, um, but then we're stepping outside the boundaries of Scrum. Now we're kind of doing our own customized variant, which I think is totally fine. Um, it's just, this is what Scrum as defined in the Scrum Guide requires of your teams. Scrum doesn't require a specific event structure. Like it doesn't tell you how to do your daily scrum or how to do your uh, sprint reviews or sprint retrospectives. Although sometimes it will tell you a time box. It will tell you how long that event has to be. It doesn't recommend an estimation or a forecast method. Sometimes this is a surprise to Scrum people. Uh, story points are not part of Scrum. Uh, that is something that other people have come up with that they have decided to use with Scrum to do sprint planning, but Scrum does not tell you how to do it. You can use any estimation or forecast technique that you choose. Uh, it does not include sprint commitments in the sense of, you are committing to a number of backlog items to complete. It did used to. The Scrum Guide did used to define sprint commitments that way, but now Scrum defines the commitment as a commitment to the sprint's goal, not to a body of backlog items. And Scrum does not dictate any kind of workflow management strategy other than the mechanism of the sprint itself. So it does mandate the sprint, but within the confines of the sprint, it doesn't really tell you how to manage your work items. You could start them all at once. You could do them one at a time. You could pair up on each one. Scrum doesn't tell you uh, how to manage your actual work items as, as they move through the flow. What does Kanban require? Kanban requires a definition of your workflow. You have to define what your work items are, which do not have to be user stories, by the way. Uh, you have to define what the start of your flow is and what the stop of your flow is, or as I like to say, where does the clock start? Where does the clock stop? You have to define the different stages of work in progress. So many of you have probably seen a Kanban board before. Um, a lot of times you'll see stages like something that looks like analysis, doing and done, uh, development, doing and done, testing, doing and done, deploy, or something like that. Um, the highest level of abstraction that you might see a Kanban board at is to do doing and done. A lot of people use that for their personal Kanban boards. But you have to have some sort of definition of the stages of your work in progress. You also have to define how you're going to control your work in process. Now, Kanban doesn't tell you how to do that. Now, a lot of you are probably thinking about whip limits, right? You're thinking about the numbers that people write on top of the columns. That is a common way people do it, but Kanban doesn't actually make you do it that way. You can actually limit whip however you want. You just have to have a control policy. Kanban requires you to have explicit policies around your workflow. Um, how do you know what card to pull next? How do you know when a card is done with development but ready for the next stage? You have to define all those things. Again, it doesn't tell you how or what those policies should be. It just requires you to have them. And then finally, your definition of workflow requires an SLE, a service level of expectation, which is some published metric where you tell observers 
what the expectation is of how long it takes you to deliver an item. So most L SLEs look something like 85% um, of items are completed in 13 days or less. Like that would be an example of an SLE. Kanban also requires some kind of visualization of your definition of workflow. Now, like I said, we've all seen Kanban boards that have the linear columns, but it doesn't have to look that way. I've actually, with teams, created Kanban boards that look like targets where things moved into the bullseye. Uh, I've worked with teams where the visualization looked more like a shoots and ladders game because at different stages, uh, parts of the work item would get routed to specific people and then they would come back into the common pool. So we had to create a visualization around that. Um, so again, it doesn't tell you what the visualization has to be. You just have to have one. Kanban requires continuous improvement. It doesn't tell you how to do that. It doesn't specify an event. You have to come up with that yourself, but you do have to continuously improve. And it requires flow metrics, it requires you to keep metrics around things like throughput, work in process, work item age, cycle time, those kinds of things. Kanban does not require any roles or accountabilities. It doesn't require any meetings or events. It doesn't require any estimation or forecast methods. It doesn't require any specific policies. Both facilitate incremental delivery. Neither of them talk about engineering. Neither of them mandate any uh, you know, TDD or um, domain-driven design or uh, CICD or anything like that. That is kind of up to your teams to figure out. And both of them incorporate an overlapping progressive application of each part of the software. I meant to say software development lifecycle. I kind of botched that acronym, software life development cycle. It should be SDLC. Um, as you develop a feature rather than a phase gate approach to the whole project. So the idea is that analysis, development, testing, these are all overlapping activities that happen over and over and over again throughout product development, rather than being distinct phases that the product moves through. It's important to note that both Scrum and Kanban have overall mechanisms that can increase your agility. So it's not a matter of one being agile with air quotes, one not being agile. It's not even a matter of one being more agile than the other. They both have mechanisms that if you use them can increase your agility. One isn't necessarily agile and the other isn't. So let's do a quick overview of what each of these systems require. So here's what Scrum requires, or how I like to say it, this is what Scrum really cares about. Okay, so if you've ever read the Scrum Guide, these should be familiar. We have the values, commitment, focus, openness, respect, and courage. And in order to do Scrum, like you have to have all these things. If, you, if your team decides, hey, we don't wanna value courage, you can't, uh, Scrum makes you. And since you're all a pack of cowards, they can probably force you to do so very easily, you know? So Scrum requires a certain set of values. It requires these accountabilities, developers, product owners, Scrum master, requires these events, sprint, sprint planning, daily Scrum, sprint review, sprint re retrospective, and it requires these artifacts to come out of all this, the product backlog, the sprint backlog, and the increment. So these are the things that are mandatory parts of Scrum. Now, of course, as teams, we can always decide, hey, we don't wanna do this, that, or the other thing, um, but then we're stepping outside the boundaries of Scrum. Now we're kind of doing our own customized variant, which I think is totally fine. Um, it's just, this is what Scrum as defined in the Scrum Guide requires of your teams. Scrum doesn't require a specific event structure. Like it doesn't tell you how to do your daily scrum or how to do your uh, sprint reviews or sprint retrospectives. Although sometimes it will tell you a time box. It will tell you how long that event has to be. It doesn't recommend an estimation or a forecast method. Sometimes this is a surprise to Scrum people. Uh, story points are not part of Scrum. Uh, that is something that other people have come up with that they have decided to use with Scrum to do sprint planning, but Scrum does not tell you how to do it. You can use any estimation or forecast technique that you choose. Uh, it does not include sprint commitments in the sense of, you are committing to a number of backlog items to complete. It did used to, 
The Scrum Guide did used to define sprint commitments that way, but now Scrum defines the commitment as a commitment to the sprint's goal, not to a body of backlog items. And Scrum does not dictate any kind of workflow management strategy other than the mechanism of the sprint itself. So it does mandate the sprint, but within the confines of the sprint, it doesn't really tell you how to manage your work items. You could start them all at once. You can do them one at a time. You could pair up on each one. Scrum doesn't tell you uh, how to manage your actual work items as, as they move through the flow. What does Kanban require? Kanban requires a definition of your workflow. You have to define what your work items are, which do not have to be user stories, by the way. Uh, you have to define what the start of your flow is and what the stop of your flow is, or as I like to say, where does the clock start? Where does the clock stop? You have to define the different stages of work in progress. So many of you have probably seen a Kanban board before. Um, a lot of times you'll see stages like something that looks like analysis, doing and done, uh, development, doing and done, testing, doing and done, deploy, or something like that. Um, the highest level of abstraction that you might see a Kanban board at is to do, doing and done. A lot of people use that for their personal Kanban boards. But you have to have some sort of definition of the stages of your work in progress. You also have to define how you're going to control your work in process. Now, Kanban doesn't tell you how to do that. Now, a lot of you are probably thinking about whip limits, right? You're thinking about the numbers that people write on top of the columns. That is a common way people do it, but Kanban doesn't actually make you do it that way. You can actually limit whip however you want. You just have to have a control policy. Kanban requires you to have explicit policies around your workflow. Um, how do you know what card to pull next? How do you know when a card is done with development but ready for the next stage? You have to define all those things. Again, it doesn't tell you how or what those policies should be. It just requires you to have them. And then finally, your definition of workflow requires an SLE, a service level of expectation, which is some published metric where you tell observers what the expectation is of how long it takes you to deliver an item. So most L SLEs look something like 85% um, of items are completed in 13 days or less. Like that would be an example of an SLE. Kanban also requires some kind of visualization of your definition of workflow. Now, like I said, we've all seen Kanban boards that have the linear columns, but it doesn't have to look that way. I've actually, with teams, created Kanban boards that look like targets where things moved into the bullseye. Uh, I've worked with teams where the visualization looked more like a shoots and ladders game because at different stages, uh, parts of the work item would get routed to specific people and then they would come back into the common pool. So we had to create a visualization around that. Um, so again, it doesn't tell you what the visualization has to be. You just have to have one. Kanban requires continuous improvement. It doesn't tell you how to do that. It doesn't specify an event. You have to come up with that yourself, but you do have to continuously improve. And it requires flow metrics, it requires you to keep metrics around things like throughput, work in process, work item age, cycle time, those kinds of things. Kanban does not require any roles or accountabilities. It doesn't require any meetings or events. It doesn't require any estimation or forecast methods. It doesn't require any specific policies. It requires you to have policies, but it doesn't require specific policies that it tells you that you need to have. It doesn't even require a Kanban board. And then my own personal favorite is Kanban doesn't require you to have any values. So you are free to be amoral, unprincipled jerks and still use Kanban effectively, which for people like me is a real bonus of Kanban, right? So I wanted to go over those lists. Some of you are probably thinking, yeah, I already knew this stuff. But the reason I wanted to highlight them is because when you see what the strategies care about, uh, then you really get insight into what their focus is and what their purpose is. And this allows you to decide if you want to use one or the other, or you want to try to use both of them together. 
So I'm going to start painting with very broad brushstrokes here. Uh, any one of these points are debatable. In fact, I wrote these points and I could debate with any one of these points in particular. So just think of them as very broad generalizations. We could all come up with exceptions to each of these for sure. Um, they're just kind of broad generalizations to kind of help us think about these strategies, generally speaking. So Scrum generally tends to focus on the structure of the team and its interactions. What accountabilities need to be present? Who are the team members? Um, what are the events that they need to participate in? Uh, Scrum also specifies a lot of what to do. Obviously, this is a matter of opinion. Some of us come from backgrounds where Scrum is very liberating, right? And Scrum even refers to itself as a lightweight framework, right? And depending on your background, it may really seem that way. But in comparison to something like Kanban, Scrum does have a lot of specifics in it about what to do. It tells you what accountabilities you have to have. <clears throat> it tells you what events you have to have. Sometimes it tells you how long those events can be. It tells you what values you have to have. Um, so there's actually a lot of specificity in Scrum compared to some of the other lean or agile uh, systems and frameworks that are out there. Most of what it leaves to a team's discretion is about the product. Okay, what are we going to put into the product? And this is where Scrum really shines, is in those environments where we don't really know. We have to figure it out. The, the product is not very deterministic. We, we need market uh, response. We need user feedback to figure out where we're going to go with this thing. We don't have a good, strong, preconceived idea of what the product is going to be. And so that's where Scrum is the most open-ended is uh, what we're going to do with this product. When we flip over to the Kanban side, we find that Kanban focuses on structuring the workflow. So these top two bullet points, I think, are probably the most helpful. Scrum is really focused on the team structure and the interactions that you need to have to be effective. Kanban is focused on the structure that the workflow needs to have to be effective. And this is why, you know, I think Scrum focuses a little bit more on the agile side of the fence. Kanban focuses a little more on the lean side of the fence. Kanban specifies the areas that you need to manage, but it leaves the how up to you. In almost every case, Kanban will not tell you, you need to have a thing and here's what it needs to look like. It will tell you, you need to have this thing and now I'm going to go away and have coffee and you guys figure out what this thing is going to look like, which can sometimes be very frustrating for teams and sometimes can be very liberating for teams. Most of the stuff to figure out on the Kanban side is how the team wants to work together, which is interesting, isn't it? Because look at what Scrum focuses on, right? And most of the blanks to fill in in Kanban are how do you want the team to be structured and how do you want it to work together? Well, that's what Scrum mostly provides, right? And so now you can start to see why some people uh, will combine these things because Kanban says very little about team structure or roles or, or who's on the team, who's off the team or anything like that. Kanban also has better looking practitioners. Now, I realize that this may be a highly contentious point, but I mean, come on. I mean, exhibit A, right? Case closed, right? I mean, so why am I still single? It's, it's a total mystery to me. All right, let's talk about the way these different systems limit work in process because they both do it, but they do it very differently. Okay, here's the way Scrum does it. Every sprint has a goal. By the way, if this is news to you, uh, hit me up. Because <laughs> probably like me, you learned Scrum a long time ago. And it, it may look a lot different today than it did when, when you and I first learned it. With Scrum, every sprint has a goal. The team selects the amount of work they believe they can complete in the sprint that will achieve that goal. I, When I run Scrum teams, I also insert the word smallest the team should select the smallest amount of work they believe they can complete in the sprint that will achieve the goal. Now, how do they arrive at this belief? It's, it's up to you. People sometimes use story points and velocity or they use flow metrics, they use all kinds of things. 
But ultimately, this is what happens. We got a goal. The team's like, okay, here's what I think we can get done that will accomplish the goal. You can only pull in new work if it into the sprint if it doesn't put the goal at risk. Okay, Scrum doesn't say you can't pull other stuff into the sprint. You can. You just can't jeopardize the goal. That that amount of work that needs to be done to accomplish the goal that has to happen. The goal is the commitment. And in order to get there, this tends to require some degree of sizing and estimation because you're working in a time box. Um, since the time box is part of the whip control mechanism, you have to have some idea of how long things will take, even if it's just a broad brushstroke idea. Um, if you don't know or have an idea of how long things are going to take, it's very hard to decide if your sprint goal is realistic or not because the time box is the limiting mechanism. So I usually tell people with Scrum, goal plus time box equals whip limits. That's that's the way that works. The goal is a limiter, your time frame is a limiter, and then you only can have a limited amount of work and process at any given time based on those two factors. Kanban does this differently. Kanban declares by fiat how many items can be in progress at any given time. So there's no time box to speak of, and there's no particular goal to speak of. You can have goals in Kanban, it just doesn't require it. Instead of Kanban saying, how much can we get done in two weeks that accomplishes a goal, Kanban says, how much can we effectively have going on at any given time? And then creates a limit around that. So it's about limiting how much stuff is happening simultaneously, not how much stuff can we get done by a particular time frame. Items are continuously being pulled in at a rate that matches the completion rate. So you finish something, you start something new. You finish something, you start something new. And this never stops. There's no time box. In Scrum, the sprint is an extinction level event. In Kanban, there's nothing like this. Uh, you finish an item, you pull an item. You finish an item, you pull an item. And in this environment, because you're not concerned about a time box, instead you're concerned about how much you have going on at any moment in time. You're concerned about that number then sizing and estimation tend to be less relevant because some things are going to take longer than other things. It really doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is how much do we have going on right now? Is it five items? Okay, that's cool. It doesn't really matter that one item has taken 20 days and another item has taken three. It just matters how much do we have going on right now in order for Kanban to work. Let's talk about forecasting. Scrum requires forecasting for each sprint that is actually in the Scrum Guide, but it doesn't tell you how. And so teams often use story points to do this, although that's not a part of Scrum. It doesn't require you to do that. And then the use of velocity is common or not required. In other words, um, teams will add up the amount of story points that they've accomplished in previous sprints and then use that to make assumptions about the story point totals for future sprints. Um, I will tell you, in, in the interest of full disclosure, and if you follow me on LinkedIn, you probably know this already. I'm not a huge fan of story points, but I will grudgingly accept them based on how the team is using them. It is, however, open war between me and Velocity. There is no neutral ground about me and Velocity. We are enemies. There is no white flag. Um, that's just kind of the way it's going to go. And I'll be happy to talk with you about that outside of this presentation if you want to know why that is. Um, or if you follow me on LinkedIn for longer than two seconds, you will figure out why that is. Um, but uh, if you are using Velocity, I highly recommend you to find an alternative way. And maybe some of our conversations about Kanban um, will, uh, will give you some other ways, some other ways that, that you might want to do some of these things. Uh, yeah, so if we're at a party and you bring up Velocity, um, I'm just going to have to ask you to leave. I mean, that's that's just the way it is. I guess it depends on on how many drinks you've bought me prior to that. There's probably an equation here somewhere. I'll, I'll think more about it. But just just yeah, I don't like velocity. Let's let's just leave it at that. Kanban on the flip side requires a service level expectation. We talked about this earlier. You know, 85% of items will be completed in 13 days or less. And that is kind of the expectation that the organization has around individual items. And Kanban uses the actual empirical throughput data 
to project the completion rates of work items. In other words, instead of taking like a number of story points, Kanban says, how often does this team normally finish things? Is it two things per week? Is it five things per day? What is it? What's their historical rate of completion? And then it uses that to project future rates of completion. And that's where the Monte Carlo simulations come in. If you've heard that, Monte Carlo simulations take these throughput runs and just do simulation after simulation of possible futures. You look at the distribution of those futures and then you can report those probabilities. So like when I talk to clients and they're like, um, how long is this epic gonna take? I can say, well, there's a 75% chance we'll have this done by April 1st or earlier. There's an 85% chance that it will be April 8th or earlier. There's a 95% chance that it will be April 12th or earlier. And then the client can sort of plan around the probability and, and risk level that they feel the most comfortable on. And it's Monte Carlo simulations that enable us to do it. But the key metric is that completion rate. It's the throughput rate. So nobody's guessing anything. Nobody is estimating anything. We're just going off of our past empirical data to produce that. Now, Kanban does not require you to do those things. Uh, it does require you to track your throughput data, but it doesn't require you to use it to forecast. That's just a very common thing that Kanban teams do. So which is better? We've kind of looked at why they're different. I hope you've kind of seen why people might fight about some of this stuff, right? Like what's better, story points or, or throughput runs? You know, what's better, whip limits or sprint time boxes? And Kanban people are like, time boxes are dumb. Why do you have time boxes? They don't do anything. And, and sprint teams are like, no, the time boxes help us with the goal and the review. They help us inspect and adapt. And Kanban people are like, well, we inspect and adapt continuously. And this just goes back and forth, right? So which one is better? Here's the conclusive answer to that. It's with a question. How often does development need to pause so you can figure out what goes into the product? I alluded to this earlier in the presentation. How often with the product you're building, do you need to stop and rethink that product? How often is that a live issue for your team? that we think the product is gonna go in this direction, but we don't really know. And based on market and user response, we may have to pivot this product. We may have to change our concept of the product. We may have thought X was going into the product, but Y is actually going into the product, or we may have to kill the product altogether based on the response. How close are you to that situation? How far away from you? are that situation. Now, this is this is a continuum, right? Because no software development project has 100% certainty, right? Any software development project, you're gonna have feedback that's gonna change things, hopefully. But how much does that play into the product content? How much does that play into the product conception? Is it just like, based on feedback, we might tweak the UI, or is it based on feedback, we thought we were gonna make a Twitter competitor, but maybe we need to make an Instagram competitor instead. How high is that level of uncertainty? This is the question your teams really need to ask themselves when they're evaluating Scrum and Kanban. It's really not about whether sprints are better than flow or story points are better than throughput runs. It's really about the nature of the work your team is doing. Is the product highly exploratory or are you like, yeah, we got a pretty decent idea of what's going into this product. And we're basically going to build this thing. Yeah, we may cut some stories. We may add in some new stories, but it's pretty much going to be this. Like, at least at a high level, we, we pretty much know what's going on. If you're more towards that end of the scale, Kanban is going to work much better for you. But if you're more to the end of the scale, like, we don't know. Like, I've got two sprints planned out, and then I'm not really sure. Right, or we've got three sprints planned out, or maybe we have a tentative roadmap, but gosh, we, we could end up doing all kinds of things based on market response or based on our internal users feedback or whatever. This product may look very different at the end than we conceive of it right now. When you're, the closer you are to that, then the more valuable Scrum becomes because Scrum was designed specifically for those kinds of situations. That doesn't mean you can't use it in the other situation. You can use Scrum in well-defined products and you can use 
Kanban and very exploratory products too. I'm just trying to give you sort of a way of thinking about these strategies and where they really shine. So with each product increment, we need to see what happens so we can decide what to do next with the product. Scrum might be a good fit for you. Folks, this is why the sprint exists. This is why Scrum works in sprints. It's not to give a handy framework to, ha to hang meetings off of, okay? It's not because we're used to traditional project management where we set deadlines, so we all need a deadline, so now you got a two-week deadline. It's not because of whatever that law is that work expands to fill a lot of time. None of that is why sprints exist. Sprints exist to minimize your investment to a very small product increment so that you can evaluate the impact of that investment and then decide if you want to keep going. Okay? So you're only putting in a, a week's worth into the product. You're only investing two weeks worth into the product because the, the assumption is you don't know if you're doing the right thing or not. And we need the feedback cycle, that sprint review to give us the feedback that we need. Now, you know, depending on how we get feedback, there may be a time delay there. I may not be able to get the market response I need from sprint one in sprint one, maybe I can, I mean, that's ideal, but it might be I acquire the, that over time and maybe it's sprint three when I really know what I needed to know about sprint one. That's fine, but, but those are the situations in which Scrum really does well, where we just don't know what the end result is gonna be. So here's some common Scrum scenarios. You're creating a new disruptive product in the market, or you've got a product in a market with heavy competition, so you need to differentiate yourself in some way. This is why Scrum was developed in manufacturing, by the way. Like, how do you make a camera that's different than all the other cameras out there? How do you make photocopiers that are different than all the other photocopiers out there? Maybe you're making a product that's just wholly unlike anything you've, you've ever attempted before, and you need that caution built into it. Whenever you are highly uncertain about the direction that the product needs to take, or even if the product is even worth doing. These are times when Scrum is really valuable. There are also other ways to handle this, right? You've probably heard about MVPs or Tame Flows moves. So there are other mechanisms uh, besides a sprint that might accomplish these things. But this is where Scrum is really great. Now, again, please don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying if you don't fit this situation, stop using Scrum. That is not at all what I'm saying. You can absolutely use Scrum in other kinds of scenarios and even scenarios that have a relative certainty to them. All I'm saying is the closer you are to this, the more awesome Scrum is going to be. The further away you are from this, the less valuable Scrum as a framework becomes. And that doesn't mean you can't still pick and choose stuff that's valuable. It's just the further you get away from very exploratory, the product development, the less useful some of the scrum mechanisms become. You, the, you just don't need them as much. You don't get as much value out of them. Uh, we're gonna talk about that phenomenon here in a second. What if you're in a situation where you're like, we got a backlog full of user stories and every sprint, we just pull them out of the backlog and we just go, right? Our sprint planning is, What's the next body of work we can get done from the backlog? Our sprint goal is finish the stuff we pulled from the backlog, right? Like <laughs> teams like this, right? We got a backlog full of stuff. We're probably not going to get it all done. The priorities are probably going to change, but yeah, we're just ready to go, right? Sprint planning, pull up the next 10 items. You think we can get these done? Yep. Okay, let's go. Our sprint planning takes 10, 10 minutes, you know? Like if that's the situation you're in where you've just got a body of work and you're just churning through it, and yeah, the contents may change somewhat for sure. New stories will get added, other stories will be cut, but it's just not gonna be a dramatic change. You're not really gonna be pivoting the product that much. You're just chomping through basically a, a feature list really at, at some point. Then Kanban is gonna be way better in that scenario because it's a continuous flow. Why do you need to stop? Like, like what is it you have to figure out every two weeks? nothing right or very little adjustments right you're still getting feedback you're still making adjustments but it's like okay uh these priorities are more important than these priorities or yeah the customers don't like this being in this tab we need to move it to this tab or hey we thought the feature worked this way it actually works this other way like those are the things you're figuring out you're not like should we even keep building this right or is this even the right product you're not you're not asking those things every two weeks so why do it 
right? Why not have a continuous flow through the work that is relatively well-defined? And the closer you are to that end of the spectrum, Kanban as a strategy becomes a lot more valuable. So here's some co common, common Kanban, that's hard to say, scenarios. Uh, you're doing new line of business software for internal use. So this is like 90% of the work my company does for clients. And that's why we use Kanban for most of our projects. When we're doing something that's highly exploratory and volatile, we might use Scrum at least for a while. But for most of our uh, projects, uh, it's internal line of business software. They're like, we need insurance claims processing software, and we're not going to get a third of the way into it. And they're going to be like, no, we've thought about it. And what we really want is, you know, personal finance management software. Like that's just not going to happen. Right. So we don't need to take baby steps into the product domain. We can just go through and we can adapt to change along the way. We aren't going to be pivoting on the product in a, in a major way. Um, it's the next phase of development on an established product. You may have a product that you scrummed the heck out of in the beginning, but now it's pretty established. You're, you're now just adding feature sets. You're not really making big product decisions anymore. And you kind of know what's coming next. And, you know, that's a common Kanban scenario. Uh, you might be building a product with high level similarity to products you've built before. Again, you're seeing a common refrain here, like, we just don't need to be making big pivotal decisions about the product on a regular basis. This is what Scrum facilitates. Kanban assumes you will just do this as needed and it's just not gonna be that big of an interruption very often, right? Um, when you, whenever you are relative, relatively certain the product needs to be built and what will need to go into it. So again, doesn't mean you can't use Kanban for highly exploratory products, we do. Um, it's, it, it doesn't mean you can't do it. I'm just saying that the closer you are to this, the more Kanban is really going to shine as opposed to something like Scrum. I don't believe every team should be using Scrum. I don't believe every team should be using Kanban. I sure don't believe every team should be using them together. You sort of have to figure out what's the nature of our product work, what things are really going to help us out given the nature of the work that we're doing. Or do we take bits and pieces or do we combine? You know, it's, it's really the nature of the work that, that drives out these decisions, not that one framework is better than another or one framework fills in the gaps that the other framework has. So then that leads us into the question, can we ever use them together? This is not as straightforward a question as you might think. I know the right answer is yes. This is where I'm gonna offend everybody. Uh, de depending on what position you, you take on this issue. I'm about to say something that's going to upset somebody. So can we use Scrum for our highly exploratory projects and Kanban for our well-defined projects? Absolutely. This is, this is the position that my company takes. We have some projects where Scrum is really going to give us something. It's really going to help us out. All those mechanisms that Scrum has in it, they're going to give us value on that particular project. Many of our projects, Scrum isn't going to do anything for us, or it's, it's at least not going to do anything that Kanban and ad hoc meetings aren't going to do for us. Um, and so, yeah, you can absolutely do it this way. Some projects we Scrum, some projects we do Kanban. Interestingly, SAFE, which we all hate, right? The, 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 the great Satan of product development, SAFE. This was the position that SAFE took. In the beginning, SAFE 1.0, it came right out and said, yeah, pick which teams you need to do Scrum, pick which teams you need to do Kanban, we don't care. And um, I, far be it from me to defend SAFE, because I don't and won't, but I think that's the right idea. I think you look at your teams, what product work are they doing? For some of them, Scrum is a good fit. For some of them, Kanban is a good fit. For some of them, a combination is a good fit. Can we use Scrum at the beginning and then switch to Kanban as the product's direction becomes clearer? This happens all the time. And let me tell you, I think this is one of the most misunderstood phenomenon with our agile teams, because here's what happens. Teams often start out with Scrum and they start doing Scrum and they get into the product. And at some point, Scrum becomes a burden to them. 
And they're like, Scrum has so many rules and has so much stuff and we don't need all this stuff. Can we please go to the anarchist wasteland that is Kanban where we can all do what we want? And a lot of people misinterpret this phenomenon. They think, well, our developers are just lazy. They don't want the, the, the structure that Scrum provides, you know, or, or developers are like Scrum just has too many rules and, and they get in the way and Scrum sucks. We all hate Scrum, uh, you know, or, um, you know, all kinds of interpretations about people and their character or about these frameworks and strategies come up. Um, and then, and then you start getting myths like, well, Scrum is good for beginning teams, but Kanban is good for mature teams. You know, if your team is just starting out, you should make them use Scrum, but then they can use Kanban later or whatever. Look, it's a very natural thing in a product life cycle to move from highly uncertain to more certain. It is very natural for the work to progress from a state of high uncertainty to less uncertainty. Rarely zero uncertainty, but less than you had in the beginning. And as that happens, as you begin to move from work where Scrum is a really good fit, Scrum will begin to feel cumbersome because the type of work you're doing no longer needs some of the mechanisms that Scrum has built into it because Scrum is built for high uncertainty. And as you move out of that domain, some of those mechanisms just don't become useful anymore. And they begin to feel very cumbersome and teams intuit that, they intuit in their gut. They're like, yeah, this thing we were doing, like it was fine at the beginning, but now I hate it, right? And we have all kinds of stories about that. It may very well be that your product has just moved into a different phase where at least some pieces of Scrum aren't as helpful as they were in the beginning. This is a perfectly natural thing to happen. And it's not about beginner teams and mature teams. It's not about Scrum being training wheels and Kanban being what the big boys use. And it's not about Scrum sucking and Kanban being cool or Scrum requiring discipline and Kanban being for people who would rather be out playing Quake. You guys remember Quake? I'm, I'm pretty old, I'm sorry. Um, it, it's not about that. It's just the nature of the work is changing. Right. And your and your team is intuiting that things that used to be helpful are not as helpful anymore. And so that's fine. This happens all the time. And there's no reason to fight it. Right. There's no reason to, to make a big deal about it. Hey, Philip, we got yeah. about maybe two minutes and we can okay. definitely take questions at the lounge after afterwards. OK, so cool. Because I'm almost done. Uh, uh, so, OK, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we use Scrum to plan our product increments? do the product stuff, but then use Kanban to manage the workflow within the sprint. Yes, there are even courses about how to do this. And this is how most people combine Scrum and Kanban actually, is they use Kanban within a sprint to manage the workflow of the sprint items, but they use Scrum for the larger structure to figure out what, what you're gonna work on and the product increments and that sort of thing. Here's the thing that I highly discourage people from doing. Can we do Scrum, but use the parts about Kanban we like, such as whip limits and flow metrics? I would not do this. Kanban is designed for continuous flow. And if you're like, well, we'll do Scrum, but then we'll do flow metrics. I find this to be highly problematic. Flow metrics really jackknife in a time boxed environment. Um, they don't tell you what you want to know, or at least they give you a very skewed picture. And if you know what to look for, you can work around it. But if you don't, um, this is actually kind of an unhelpful situation, and this is what a lot of people do. So we can we can talk more about that if you're curious. Again, this is my opinion, and it is a highly unpopular opinion. Okay, well, can we do Kanban and still have daily stand-ups and regular retrospectives and reviews? Absolutely. This is what my teams do. We do Kanban. We borrow stuff from Scrum that we like. This is my contact information. Um, uh, my email address, our website, my LinkedIn. I also do a podcast called Agile Bytes that you can find on Spotify or wherever fine podcasts are sold. Um, this is a podcast we release every week, every Monday. It's about Agile and we really get into the weeds on a wide variety of topics. People have found it helpful and I hope you would like to listen to it too. Again, so sorry for being late. Thank you guys for sticking with me. Um, I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity and I hope that some of this material was helpful. Yeah, awesome, awesome talk, Philip. And um, you can join a lounge if you like. 
and people can come there and, and talk to you about stuff. There were some interesting questions about zombie scrum and, um, you know, is there a safe version of Kanban? Like there's a scrum version I, uh -huh. I, in, in safe. So <laughs> anyway, so there's some interesting questions. Maybe if you want to go over there and maybe you can okay. talk about some of these things there. Is, is the lounge in my list of breakout rooms? Yeah, you can, if you click on it, you can just join, um, yeah, lounge okay. one, two, three, or four, and people can find you in one of those and join if they want to talk to you. Okay, I will join lounge one. Yeah, thanks again. Great talk. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So we have Amber Bartlett coming to this um, breakout.